We're back on the road to Reykjavik with Bobby Fischer. And we last left the story when he played the first game against Mark Taimanov in their quarterfinal candidates match. Played in Vancouver in 1971. So here's game two and we join the game after 45 moves and this was the position where the game was adjourned for the first time. It was a very long game. So it had been quite a complex middle game. I say middle game, it was an end game, but with many pieces on the board. Um, and Fisher had somehow fashioned an advantage. Uh, he got the initiative and so we've reached this position where Fisher has rook, bishop and four pawns against rook, knight and three. But still, not so many pawns on the board and that presents some technical difficulties. Nevertheless, of course, white, I think with best play should win this position with, with pawns on both sides of the board, then the bishop usually is much stronger uh, than the knight in this situation. And rook and bishop generally are very strong duo. So here Taimonov played rook g5 and this turns out to be a very clever defensive move actually. So let's go on. Uh, king c3, the king comes up the board, good to keep everything together. And rook a2, well this looks very powerful. The rook is able to operate here to hassle the king and a very nice step. The king comes up, everything together. It looks like, well, white is really dominating this position, actually. All looks good. Fisher making steady progress. And here Fisher played c5, which looks such an obvious move. It looks as though actually white is just going to win this game very quickly. But it actually presents white with some difficulties. Amazing. I can imagine Fisher playing this move very, very quickly. Um, it looks so natural. But let me show you what's stronger and then we'll compare the two. So instead, rook a6, as pointed out by Taimanov actually after the game, is a strong move. So the pawn is attacked, or well, if rook takes pawn then simply rook takes pawn here and that's the, the two pass pawns is winning. So king c7 to protect the pawn, all looks reasonable, and only now c5. And the point of this is that the king has been dragged to an unfortunate square. Now wherever that knight goes it's it simply, well, should be winning for white. So for example, knight f5, in this case, we can exchange off and enter into a winning rook and pawn in game. This rook does a superb job of defending the one weak pawn, attacking this one. And then the king comes around to b5. This pawn is actually quite vulnerable as well, vulnerable to attack here. And there's always the possible sweep around the other side to drive the king back. This is a winning endgame for white. So what else have we got? We've got, well, let's say, knight c8. Well, in this case, actually, I think white can simply transpose into a winning bishop versus knight endgame, actually. I don't think this presents too many difficulties. So the bishop controls this square, prevents the king attacking the pawn, and then white's king will be free to enter into the king's side. Um, I think this is just winning for white, actually. Um, if the knight goes back to e8, now we'll compare this with the game in a second. Again, I think simply rook g6 simplifying down into this endgame is actually a very simple way for white to win the position, particularly if we can fix that pawn on a light square. Um, 
I think this is this is uh, pretty easy for white. So let's just bear that in mind when we look at what happened in the game. So rook a6, a very clever move. But c5 was played by Fischer, as I said, looks really natural. The knight comes to e8, still looks as though white is completely dominating. But here's the difference between this position and the line we just looked at. Here, black's knight can actually reach this square which, well, let me show you variation. For example, if rook a8 check, let's say bishop here to defend that pawn, then the knight comes here. And this is surprisingly difficult to win with this knight covering some really important squares, covering, covering this square as well obviously blockading the pawn at some point, but actually really preventing white's king from marching in to assist the rook with some kind of mating attack. And that is hard, a hard position to break down. So Fischer returned with the rook, the rook a2. The knight came to c7, this very strong defensive square. Now it might have been best to try to swing the rook over this side and attack from the other side, but well, bishop c4 from Fischer looks like a very typical and natural move in these kind of positions to dominate black's knight. So that bishop controls these squares. But it's hard to break down, and now the king came up the board. You can see that this rook to some extent is, is tied to defending the g-pawn and we can see actually how this rook has turned into a very strong piece for black. It isn't so strong in, in many of the continuations we looked at but in this case it's actually very good. Um, if the rook checks the king goes back and you know, now what for white with this pawn attacked and this knight still doing a, an excellent job of controlling a lot of key squares. So we've got this position and Taimanov's king has just come up to c6 and it's problematic. Well you know already we have a threat of rook takes pawn. Fischer played bishop b3. Now the rook can't take the pawn I think after this, well, don't go for the king and pawn endgame with this one. I think white's king is too close. And after this, we give a check and king goes back and we can take the rook. But after bishop b3, instead of rook takes pawn, we can play knight b5 check. So this is the game continuation. And suddenly that all-important pass pawn has dropped. Hmm. Now, of course, Fischer still has the initiative here because his king is closer to black's pawns. Nevertheless, black should draw this position now with some careful play. So it's just a question of bringing the king and knight over to the king side and hoping that white can't do too much damage in between. And that is in fact what happens. Still still a little bit tricky, you know, you've got to watch out for you know tricks tricks like this and rook b6 check. Nevertheless, should be fine. And king c3, good move. Of course, Fisher is fighting to the last pawn. Still trying to get something from this position. And now Taimanov has spotted a way to just simplify. So he's given up a pawn, 
but he has clarity now. Now, it could be a scenario where black manages to exchange off knight for pawn and they've got a rook and bishop against rook endgame, which is a theoretical draw. That's one scenario. But actually, even getting that would be a massive achievement for white. Because it's really hard to arrange white pieces here somehow to, to force the advance of the H pawn. And now here, the game was adjourned for the second time. I think it's clear this position should be a draw, but you know, Fisher wants to continue. And at this point, so they have an adjournment, and they played game three in between. Now, without giving, uh, well, I, I have to give the game away, basically. Um, Taimanov was beaten in game three, a huge disappointment. We'll look at that game uh, very soon. Um, and it was a, a game which Taimanov felt he should have won. In fact, it's not so clear as we'll, we'll see. But basically, that game had a terrible effect on him. And after losing game three, he returned to this adjournment. Should be a draw, doesn't look like any particular technical difficulty. Remember in this position, of course, it's, it's not even possible to advance this pawn because there'll be a mass exchange here and the, the king and pawn endgame, king, king and rook's pawn against king is just a draw. So this is really problematic. And here I think it's surprising that Taimanov didn't simply exchange knight for bishop. It just simplifies the procedure. And then king e6. Still a few accurate moves to find. Nevertheless, someone of Taimanov's experience would be able to draw that. But no, he kept pieces on the board. He played knight g6. Rook a6, interesting move that, you know, maybe just to cut the king so it doesn't have an easy time getting through to the corner. Still, black has it under control, but still, it's slightly worrying that black's king can't easily get back. Nevertheless, after these checks, white really isn't getting anywhere. So Fisher played rook f6, and it's clear that we are heading towards the climax of the game. Of course, the rooks were exchanged. And now, the crunch moment. <clears throat> Maybe you'd like to stop and think. And you can always pause the video and think, how would you draw this position with black? Still a few little difficulties. Taimonov, unfortunately, made a blunder here. Well, let's see what he should have played. I think the simplest move is king d6. So let's see how white might try to make progress. Uh, let's say bishop e2 in order to advance the h-pawn. So we'll give a check. Let's bring the king in. And then knight f6. Obviously if the pawn advances that'll be taken with a draw. And it's actually impossible for white to dislodge these pieces. There's always um, always a square that you can find, you know, white, black and white very happily here. And another way to go. So let's say bishop f5. 
In this case, we'll play knight f3 and put the knight in front of the pawn. So the only way to dislodge the knight is to bring the king back. And in this case, we can simply give the knight away. And the king moves into the corner. The bishop is the wrong colour to drive the king out of the corner. And this, of course, is a theoretical draw. So king d6, simplest move. King e4 played by Taimanov instead, which in some ways looks perfectly natural in order to bring the king closer to the rook's pawn. But after this, white wins. There's only one move to win. Bishop c8, only move to win. The point is this, that if the knight comes to f3, well, let's play the move out. Knight f3, now white can transpose into that king and pawn endgame. And king g5 and the h-pawn rolls home. So king f4 still looks as though black should draw this position, but no, it's absolutely lost now. The king and the bishop dominate the knight. The king can't cross the line of the bishop, and this one is rolling through. So here's what happened. And the bishop is in the perfect position to stop any awkward checks. And this position is Tsuktvam. King g6. Black has no useful move here. Obviously, if the king moves, then king takes knight. And the knight moves, and the pawn goes through. Wow, what a shocker. After this, Taimanov said, I was crushed. I felt ill and was taken to hospital with a case of high blood pressure. The match was suspended for three days. Wow, that's, that's the Fisher effect for you. So remember, this was played after a dramatic game three, which Taimanov lost. And yeah, basically he was psychologically crushed. We will look at that third game in the next video. but um, And do take a look at the Fisher playlist with all the videos we've done so far if you want to get up to date with uh, what, what was going on with Fisher in these couple of years before Reykjavik. So, you know, there's stuff from 1970. And, uh, well, enjoy it. There's some fab stuff. Thanks for watching.